Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. My Bible is opened up to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to read a couple of verses at the very top of the chapter in just a moment. And you would be helped by getting a Bible open and be ready to look at that passage as well as all of the other passages that we will read and study from this morning as we open up the Word of God. I hope that you are eager to be about the business of God's Word right now. That is what these next few minutes are entirely devoted to as we want to read and consider and to think about what God's Word is saying for our lives even today. And so I'm reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading here in verse number 1. There the Corinthian letter begins like this. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you need to go to heaven? What do you need in order to get to heaven? That's the kind of question that preachers love to begin sermons with because it provokes thought. It's the kind of question that just immediately gets everybody's attention. I mean, who isn't interested in going to heaven? We're all interested in going to heaven. That's why you're listening to me right now. You want to find out what God's Word has to say about how to get from here to heaven. And so, what's that going to take? What do you need to get to heaven? Somebody maybe would offer, well, you need the forgiveness of your sins. That'd be a great place to start. And that is a great place to start. Need to obey the gospel so that we can receive pardon and forgiveness so that we can become a part of God's family. That's an absolute must. Somebody else, all right, we've gotten started. What else do you need to get to heaven? Well, somebody else might offer, well, I think you need to get a Bible. You need to get a Bible and you need to read that Bible. You need to study the Bible and you need to know what God's Word has to say. I'm all for that. I am big on Bible reading. You need to get your Bible and you need to study that. Somebody else maybe says, I, I, you need to pray. Prayer is so important in the life of a Christian and that is absolutely right. need to pray. Somebody else would say, well, you need to love Jesus. That seems like that's a must, and it is. You need to love the Lord, and when we love the Lord, that, well, that affects how we interact and how we love and how we treat other people in all other relationships. I think all of those are great answers. Can I ask you this, though? Does anybody ever answer the question of what do you need to go to heaven by saying, you know, I need to be a part of a local church. Yeah. I need to be an active and working member in a local congregation of God's people. You don't hear that so much, do you? But look again at our opening text. Paul writes to some folks who, just like you and I, they wanted to go to heaven. And he says that they have bonded themselves together, verse 2, sanctified in Christ Jesus to be a church of God's people in that city known as Corinth. Here was a group of Christians in a given location who had come together for the express purpose of helping one another to go to heaven. Have you ever considered that in order for you to go to heaven, that you need to be a part of a local church family? I should tell you that many people today, they aren't very high on that idea. People say things all the time like, I'm not really into all that organized religion as if somehow the rest of us are into disorganized religion. Or people say things like, you know, I'm just not really into the whole church-going thing. That's just, that's just not really my bag. People say things like, I'm, I'm really big on God. I definitely love Him, love Jesus. Definitely I'm all about the kingdom of God. But the local church, eh, not so much. Well, hold on just a second. How can we be all about God and all about the kingdom of God but not be vitally interested in the manifestation of that that we can all experience the local church family? If God loved the church and gave His Son for it, then why don't we love the church? Where's the emphasis on the local church today? Why don't more people see the local church family as a vital tool that is necessary to get from here to heaven? In fact, there are some folks 
who do see a bit of value in the local church. And so they make it a point to, to get their name on the roll down there, make sure to get their picture in the official church directory, but they still don't seem to really get it because they're not active in that congregation. They don't participate in that congregation. They're not working to build up their brothers and sisters in the local church. Do you want to go to heaven? I'm saying to you this morning that you need the local church family. I need the local church family. You and I need to be active participants in the local church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about people who were part of a local church and that, that needs to describe you and I as well. You know, there are many things that this coronavirus pandemic has taught us. But i got to tell you, one of the most powerful lessons that it has taught me, or maybe that it's just re-impressed upon me, is the absolute necessity of being plugged in and being connected with a family of believers who are working together to shine the light of Christ in a time and in a place where there is much darkness. And the arrangement that God saw fit to accomplish that purpose is by Christians in a given locale to pool together their talents and their resources and their energies in this collective fashion that we know as the local church. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to talk about the significance of the local church. And I hope that at least a couple of things will be accomplished. Number one, I hope that this maybe will help some folks who, who might happen to be church shopping. You know, there's always folks who are kind of kind of out there, kind of floating around a little bit, not actually settled down anywhere. Maybe they're looking for a church family to be a part of. I hope this will cause you. It'll give you some pause and cause you to realize the necessity and the urge for you to get identified. And then maybe even more so, what I really hope is that this lesson will help the rest of us who already are identified with a congregation. And I hope it'll cause us to say, you know what? That's important. I, mean, I knew it was important, but man, that is so important. And what I want to do as a result of what I've heard today is I want to ramp up. I want to turn up my level of participation in the local church. Now maybe I should just say a word about why I'm even talking about this. You know, in some ways it seems ridiculous that I should even have to even say anything about the local church relationship. If you look in your New Testament, the church is everywhere. Yes, there are places in the New Testament that speak about the church in a universal sense, but more so, there's lots of stuff in the Bible in the New Testament about the local church. Think about it. What were most of those letters, those epistles in the New Testament, who were they written to? They were written to local congregations. The local congregation in Corinth. The local congregation in Thessalonica. The local congregation in Philippi, etc., etc. Those letters were written to them to tell them how to act, how to behave, what to do, what not to do. And so how is it that we have come to a point where we have to actually stop and be reminded that, hey, the local church matters. Well, I don't know how we got here, but the truth is we are at that point. Because many people today, many Christians today, they just don't really want to identify with a local church. And you understand what I mean when I use that word identify, don't you? That's just our jargon. That's just our way of saying, join yourself to a local congregation. That's what we mean by that. That's what we're talking about when we talk about identify. And people today, many, don't want to do that. They don't want to join a local church. They don't want to identify with a local congregation. Well, why not? Well, I'll tell you, I've thought about that. I think there's at least a couple of good reasons as to why people don't want to do that. There are not good reasons, but lots of reasons as to why people don't want to do that. Maybe the first one that comes to mind is that some people, some people just don't want to make a commitment. They don't. You know, Americans in general don't want to make any kind of commitment these days. Just across the board, commitment is way down by any and every measurement. People don't want to commit to anything, whether that's the local PTA, or a gym membership, or a book club, or even marriage. 
You know, we don't want anything that's going to cramp our style or put a bind on our time. We value our personal freedom, it seems, more than anything else these days. And as a result, we don't want to do anything that's going to create an additional burden on my life. We don't want to make a commitment. Well, can I just tell you right up front? The local church, the local church is a commitment. It is. It is a huge commitment. Would you look with me in Hebrews chapter 10? In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer there speaks about some people who were lacking in their commitment. And what he says is, is he says, don't be like those people. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading here in verses 24 and 25. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, the writer says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That is a passage that's calling for commitment, isn't it? You know, we know that verse in verse 25 about, well, that's the attendance passage. This is about more than just attending. It is about the purpose of attending. It's about the point of our gathering together and our working together. This is about a commitment to my brothers and my sisters in Christ to encourage them, as the writer says, to think about them, consider them, to stir them up, and yes, to spend time with them. And I do think, I do think that people know about the kind of commitment that the Lord is calling for here, and I think that's one of the big reasons why people don't want to identify with a local church family. Secondly, though, in this connection, I would tell you that a lot of people, a lot of people don't ever identify because, because they don't want to deal with difficult brethren. They just don't. All of us probably have a church horror story, or two, or three, or four, and it is those kinds of stories that scare some people into ever identifying with a local church. And I think it pains us to have to acknowledge that that is sometimes the case. You know, the church, of course, it is the plan of God, which means that the plan for the church is absolutely perfect. It is. But in kind of an odd sort of twist and paradox, the church will never be perfect here on this earth because the church is implemented and it is full of imperfect And what that means is is that means that if you get around the local church, you probably are going to have to deal with some difficult people. You'll have to deal with folks who from time to time display pharisaical attitudes. You'll have to deal with folks who are hypocritical from time to time. Folks who are judgmental. Folks who are just hard to get along with. Folks who have weird or abrasive personalities. Folks who are bossy and always got to have their way. You know, the truth of the matter is, that's not a 21st century thing. That's not new. Would you look in your Bible again? Look in 3 John. In 3 John, only one chapter in 3 John. In 3 John, John tells us that difficult people have always made the church relationship hard. In 3 John, I'm reading here in verse 9, John says, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, the apostles. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. And he also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. I'll tell you this, I don't even think I would want to be a part of a local congregation where Diotrephes is a member. I wouldn't want to put up with that guy. Some guy who's just running roughshod over everybody. But the truth is, In practically every church, in every generation, there's going to be folks who make things difficult. There is a very human side to this divine arrangement, and it is for that reason that I think some people hesitate to identify with a local congregation. Maybe what all of this is really pointing to is the fact that that we just really don't want people in our business. I think that's really what this comes down to because some people never place membership with a local congregation because they just don't want to be held accountable. They just don't. just don't want accountability. We don't want somebody who's going to call us into account. 
The idea that maybe if I don't come to worship services for a couple of Sundays and don't say anything to anybody about that. The fact that maybe someone might call me at my home, that maybe an elder of the church, or maybe just some other brother or sister in the congregation may, may reach out to me and say, Hey, where you been? What's going on? We haven't heard from you in a while. Just wanted to see what's going on and if there's a, a problem or if you're struggling or let us know what's going on. Or, or, or even the idea that maybe I might post something on my Facebook page that might be objectionable or might be vulgar or might be immodest. The idea that a brother or a sister in the local church that they might message me and say, Hey, I'm not really sure that that's the kind of thing that Christians ought to be posting let alone being partaking in or thinking about or being involved in it in any way. The idea of that is something that we have a tendency to get very, very worked up about. You know, The truth is there's a lot of Christians who just don't want to be accountable. They don't want anybody to be asking about their life and about their choices or about their priorities. But I'm going to tell you this this morning. A huge part of the local church is that we become accountable to one another and in fact, that's the direction that I want to take the remainder of this lesson this morning. I want to talk to you about why that accountability thing, that that's actually good. That we should want, that we should invite that kind of accountability that the local church relationship brings with it. And I want to do that by sharing with you four reasons why identifying with the local church is something that you ought to do. And why you ought to see the value and the benefits of that. And I want to start that first and foremost, that whenever you identify with a local church, that marks you as a genuine believer. It does. Have you ever thought about that? It marks you as a genuine believer. Think about that. It just changes how you talk about the church, how you think about the church, how you even just refer to the church. Would you look with me in Acts chapter 9? In Acts chapter 9, we read here about the early church. This is about the church in Jerusalem. And notice with me in verse 26. You know, sometimes people object to that phrase, join the local church. People say you can't join the church. And, and, and I understand what people mean by that. I understand very clearly that it is the Lord, it is God who adds people to the church. Acts 2 verse 47 says that. He adds the saved to the church in a universal sense. But you know what? I also understand that you and I, we have to make the conscious and deliberate decision to affix ourselves, to join ourselves to a local group of Christians. And that's exactly what's going on here in Acts chapter 9. Look at verse 26. In Acts 9 verse 26, And when he, this is Saul of Tarsus, the guy that we know as Paul, when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. This one passage really makes this point better than I ever could with my own words. Because Paul wanted to be joined to this group of disciples in Jerusalem, but they didn't want him. And why? Well, because they didn't think he really was a believer. They only knew Paul as Paul the persecutor. They thought that he was their enemy. Why now is this guy who's been persecuting us, dragging us off to jail and, and even killing and being involved in that, the death of some of our brothers and sisters, why is this guy wanting to join himself to us? Why, why is he here in Jerusalem with us? He wanted to join those people because he wanted to make a very clear and loud statement and that is, I am with you. Yeah, I did a lot of rotten and awful things in my past. But I met Jesus on the road to Damascus and I learned differently. I went to Ananias and Ananias told me what I needed to do to be saved and I'm a changed man now. I am a Christian. I'm not the persecutor guy. I am a genuine believer. And Paul realized that he could not make that statement by just occasionally dropping by whenever he jolly well pleased. When you join a local church, when you become a member, there's no question about who you are or what you are all about. You think about it. If somebody asks you the question, hey, do you go to church? And you say, oh yeah, I, uh, I go down there to Lakeside sometimes. That's totally different from saying, yes, 
I am a member of the Lakeside Church of Christ. That is completely different, isn't it? It sounds different because it is different. You know, sometimes I am afraid that people get confused. And they think that this going to church thing means that, well, because I go, well, that means that I'm part of the church. But you know what? Just because you drive to a church building on Sunday and you sit through a worship assembly, that does not mean that you automatically are a part of the church. The church is not simply where you go. The church is a relationship that you are in, number one, in a relationship with God, but furthermore, in a relationship with other believers, vertically and horizontally. And that all begins when you identify, when you join yourself, when you say, hey, just like Paul, hey, I'm with you guys. I want to be a part of this team. Paul saw the importance of being identified with fellow believers and you and I, you and I need to see that as well. Furthermore, you should know that whenever you become a member of a local church, then secondly, secondly what that does is that helps to move you out of isolation. It moves you out of isolation. Now, I know the thought of being moved out of isolation, that is probably music to our ears right now as many of us are quarantined in our various ways. But I want us to think about this in a, in a spiritual sense. Have you ever noticed all of those verses in the New Testament that talk about the relationship that Christians are to have with one another? All those one another verses that describe our obligations to each other? Can we just stack up a whole bunch of those right now? Can we just stack up a bunch and just read through some of those very quickly? Let's start in Romans chapter 12 and we'll just kind of move our way forward. In Romans chapter 12 and in verse 10, you're going to have the advantage because you're seeing the verses on the screen. But read along with me, Romans chapter 12 and in verse 10. Paul says there, Romans 12 verse 10, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Maybe just turn over a page or two to Romans 15. Look in verse 14. In verse 14, Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. We've already gotten already just in those couple of verses. We've already got like two or three one another things. Look in 2 Corinthians, please. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, this is verse 11. In 2 Corinthians 13 and in verse 11, there Paul says, finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Let's keep that rolling. Look in Ephesians 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, they're at the very end of the chapter. In Ephesians 4, at the conclusion of all these practical admonitions, Paul says in verse 32, he says, be kind to one another. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. Christians, how you treat other Christians. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. How about in James now? In James chapter 5. Man, we've gotten like a half dozen one another's already just from these few verses. In James chapter 5, look in verse 16. In James 5 and in verse 16, James says, therefore, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Can I throw one more into the mix? Look in 1 Peter 4. In 1 Peter, just a couple pages over. In 1 Peter chapter 4, this is verse 10. 1 Peter 4 verse 10, Peter says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Can I just ask you this morning, are, are you doing that stuff? Are you, are you doing those things? That's just the hem of the garment. There's, there's about a dozen more we could have added to that list. But are you doing that stuff? And if the answer is yes, then who are you doing those one another's with? If you're not a member of a local church, then who are you confessing your sins to? and praying for, and showing honor to, and comforting, and loving, and forgiving, etc., etc. Who exactly are you one anothering with if you're not a part of a local church family? The sad reality is, I believe we've got way too many Christians today 
who are all too content to just kind of remain in isolation. They just kind of float in when they want to float in. And they kind of just float over here when they want to float over here. They come when they want to come and they don't come when they don't want to come. And as a result of all of that, they, uh, well, they just don't feel like they're really part of anything. In fact, you can tell it by their language. They always talk about them down there. What are they doing? Are they having services today? That's not one another language. That's them over there, and I'm over here, and they can do their thing, and I'm going to do my thing, and never the two shall mix. Yet I am going to remind you that God never intended for Christianity to be a solo endeavor. Do you remember in the very beginning in the book of Genesis? Do you remember what God said about Adam? After God created Adam, what, what, what did he notice? After trying to bring him all the different animals of the field and realizing, well, none of those were really a match, God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And in much the same way, it is not good for a Christian to be alone. And just as God provided a helper for Adam, in the same way, God has provided helpers for the Christian. He has provided us the church to help us in our journey toward heaven. And that is why several times throughout the course of this lesson, I have referred to the local church family. Family. God does not want you to be isolated, to be detached. No, He wants you to be a part of a local church family so that you can do those one another things and you can help the body of Christ to grow. And since I've just now said something about growing, that leads me to this third idea. And that is whenever you are a part, a member of a local church, then that gives you opportunities and that helps to facilitate your spiritual growth. I am persuaded that no one will ever reach their full potential as a disciple of Christ by being an outside spectator. By just kind of sitting over here on the bench while they watch everybody else do church. And that is one of the reasons that I believe that God designed the local church because it provides tremendous opportunities for us to grow in our walk with the Lord. I want you to please not think of this just strictly in terms of the local church worship assembly. The kinds of things that happen normally when we're not in a pandemic, when we're assembled inside the four walls of the church building. Certainly, certainly there are things that are going to help facilitate our growth that take place in the worship assembly. Think about for men, young men in particular. The worship assembly is an opportunity for them to grow, to develop their talents in leading in singing, or in leading in prayer, or leading our minds at the, at the table as we observe the Lord's Supper, reading Scripture, all of those things, those are great opportunities for growth, and the church provides that. There's opportunities when it comes to, to, to teaching, teaching Bible classes, signing up to teach, or maybe just being a helper in a Bible class, always looking for opportunities and folks to help out in those ways. But you know what? It's not just limited to what we do here within these four walls a couple, two or three different hours a week. No! It's so much more. There's so many other responsibilities and opportunities outside of these four walls. What about, what about folks, folks who prepare food and send cards to folks who are sick or folks who have lost loved ones or folks who just need lifted up? We, we have people in this congregation who, who do that regularly. They're just, they're, it's like they've got tractor laser beam. They're just always looking for those opportunities to do that very kind of thing. There's just stuff going on everywhere. Maybe it's making CDs of the sermons and getting those distributed to people. Maybe it's taking care of the, the messages on the sign that are out at the front of the, at the beginning of the parking lot there. Maybe that's going and visiting the widows and the shut-ins when there's not a pandemic going on. There's just a whole bunch of stuff. Setting up Bible studies, helping to clean the church, but picking up sticks out here in the parking lot. The list goes on and on and on. Ways that we can serve Ways that we can use our bodies, and it seems like there's just never enough bodies to do all the work that needs to be done. But you can help to do that work when you are a part of a local congregation. And in turn, that's going to help you to grow. 
Can you go back to Ephesians again? We looked at Ephesians 4 a moment ago. Would you look there again? In Ephesians chapter 4, this is in verse 15. In Ephesians 4 verse 15, Paul talks here about working together in the body of Christ and the benefits of that. He says in Ephesians 4 and in verse 16, he says, "...from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow." so that it builds itself up in love. Paul says that when each part, that is each member, is working properly, then the body, the whole, the whole group grows. And the implication of that is what? The implication is, is if the body is growing, well then by necessity that means that individual members have to be growing. Isn't that what we need? Isn't that what is expected of us? Growth. Grow to be like Jesus. In fact, if you look at verse 15, the very previous verse, that's exactly what Paul says. He says we are to grow up in every way into Him, into Christ. If you're a part of the local church, you're going to be provided with numerous opportunities to grow. You will have opportunities to discover and to develop your talents, maybe even talents you didn't even know that you had. You have chances to then use your abilities in the service of the Lord. I I know of cases of of people that have been able to use skills that that they never thought possible could be used in God's service. Good sister that I know of, she she, she spoke Spanish fluently. And for the first 40, 50 years of her life, she never would have even thought about using that for the Lord. And then one day, a Spanish-speaking family came into the congregation to visit. And before you know it, she found her role. Her role was to help to translate for those people. What a blessing that is, using her abilities for the Lord in that way. You'll have the benefit of being able to learn from others when you're part of the local church. You'll have the privilege of working shoulder to shoulder alongside fellow laborers in God's work. When you are a part of the local church, you will be better equipped. I'll say it again, better equipped to be the kind of disciple that God wants you to be than if you were off just trying to do that all by yourself. Which leads me directly into this final point this morning. And that is identifying with a local church, what that's going to do is that is going to provide you with the accountability that you need and I need to remain faithful. Of all the benefits that come with being a member of a local church, I think this may be the most valuable. Because what we're talking about now is the difference between falling away from the Lord and remaining faithful to the Lord. Would you look with me in Hebrews chapter 3, please? In Hebrews chapter 3, I'm reading here in verse 12. In Hebrews chapter 3, this is verse 12. The writer gives us some more of that one another language. Notice this one. This is a really important one. In Hebrews 3, this is verse 12. He says, Take care, brothers lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Can I go back to that that phone call illustration from earlier where somebody calls you and they say, Hey, where you been? Been missing you. Haven't seen you at services for the last for the last few weeks. What's going on? And that, that kind of that, that chafing and that bristling that we get because, ah, oh, I don't want to have to answer to somebody. I don't want somebody who's all up in my business. Can I ask, why do we act like that? Why do we do that? Why do we act like accountability is some kind of a bad thing to be avoided? You know, this past week, my wife had to go to the doctor and had to get some blood tests because of some issues that she's been having during the pregnancy. We're getting down into the home stretch now. And she had those blood tests run. And i got to tell you, we were told, hey, we're going to get the results back maybe by the end of the week or by the first of the next week. I really would not like it if the doctor or whoever gets back those results. And after they get those results and they're looking them over and if they were to say, you know what, I, uh, whew, I really don't want to have to be the one to call Mrs. McKibben up and tell her the results that I'm seeing here on the page, they, they really don't look all that good. You know, I really don't want to cause an intrusion for her. I don't want to cause a problem for her. I don't want to be getting up into their business by telling her what I'm seeing here. 
I don't want to have to make that kind of a phone call that's going to really, really upset somebody, so I'll just, I'll just not say anything. No, are you kidding me? I want to know if there is something wrong with the health of my wife. Why then, may I ask? Why then would I not want to know if there is something that is threatening the health of my soul? That seems to me to be of greatest importance. I thought we were talking here about going to heaven, weren't we? Isn't that where we started? About going to heaven? Listen, brother or sister, if you're not coming to worship services, if you're not living like you ought to be living, if you're not serving the Lord faithfully as one of His children, don't you want somebody to call you? Don't you want somebody to say something to you about that? Don't you want someone to speak up and say, Hey, what's going on? Well, what's the deal here? Now, hey, this isn't working what you're doing. This isn't going to get you from earth to heaven. We're all planning to go to heaven someday. And we were kind of hoping that you'd be there too, but the way that you're going, I, I'm not really sure that we're going to see you there. What in the world is going on? Don't you want somebody to call you up and to just say, Hey, absolutely I do. I want somebody to say something to me. Why? Because I want to go to heaven. That is more important to me than anything else. And you know what? Even if it hurts my feelings, even if it does feel a little bit intrusive, even if I'm inclined to say, you know what, it's none of your business, it doesn't matter because I'm trying to go to heaven, aren't you? I want someone to exhort me in the way that Hebrews chapter 3 talks about. In fact, would you look in Galatians chapter 6? In Galatians chapter 6, here's one more of those one another passages. In Galatians chapter 6, this is in verse number 1. In Galatians 6 and in verse 1, Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Let's just be honest. We all live a little bit better when we know somebody's watching, don't we? I don't care how good of a driver you are or you think you are. When you're going down the road and a police car pulls in behind you, uh huh, you quickly in that moment become a really good driver. Getting the hands up into the 10 and 2 position. I'm just, I'm at 55, no, actually under 55. Let's go about 53. I'm a really, really good driver when that policeman comes behind me. We're just better whenever we're accountable. And this morning I'm saying to you that if you are serious about going to heaven, then you need to be in a relationship where you are accountable. You need the local church family to help keep watch for you and for your soul so that you do not get entangled in sin, so that you do not get drifted away in lukewarmness and indifference, so that you do not get swept away in error. And you know what? Even if you do get tangled up in sin or lukewarmness or in error, guess what? You need the local church family to help you, to restore you back to faithfulness once more. Now, as I think about all of that, what that seems to me then is that seems to me that that's four really great reasons to be an active part of a local church. And if we had more time, we could have easily tripled the size of that list. But I hope that these four are sufficient to help you to see the absolute clarity of being a member of a local church is that that is so vitally important. In fact, it is my prayer that if you are not a working, active member of a local church, my prayer is, is that you will take action immediately to rectify that. To be identified as a genuine believer. To get out of isolation. To grow, to be accountable, and to take advantage of this wonderful tool that God has given us. You know, I began this lesson by asking... What do you need to get to heaven? Get you some forgiveness. That's a great place to start. Grab yourself a Bible and maybe a Bible reading schedule. That's good. Learn how to pray. Oh, that's definitely awesome. Love the Lord with all your heart. Absolutely essential. 
Let me add to that list. Join a local church. I dare say that you cannot get to heaven without helping and receiving the help that comes from the local church relationship. Let's pray about that. Would you pray with me? Our dear gracious God, Father, we are so thankful in Your wisdom that You have given us the plan and the pattern for the local church. That we might have others of like precious faith who care for us, who love us and help us so that we can become more and more like Your Son. Father, help us to value and to see anew just how precious the relationships that we share in Christ, how valuable those relationships really are. Help us, Father, to deepen those bonds of love and care for one another so that someday all of us, we will rejoice around Your throne for all time as we praise You for redeeming sinners like us and bringing us into Your glorious family. And it is through the name of your Son and our Savior and our older brother, Jesus the Christ, that we pray. And amen.